Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we are once again joined by Dr. Andre Boris. Andre is a postdoctoral researcher in the Hevia Group at the University of Bern, and he's actually joined us once before in episode 45 when he came on to talk about Schleinkine technique and the Schleinkine Survival Guide. Today he has some new and exciting research to talk about, so I'll go ahead and let you get started, Andre. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you for the introduction, Matt, and for the opportunity to present some of my postdoctoral research from the Kali group on the phosphoborovitic reaction. Phosphoalkenes are compounds with phosphorus carbon double bonds, and these are isoelectronic to alkenes and imines. Unlike imines, however, in which the highest occupying molecular orbital is a nitrogen lone pair, the HOMO in phosphoalkenes is a PC pi bond, meaning these are in fact more similar to alkenes. Phosphoalkenes started off as laboratory curiosities, but have now found a range of uses, including as ligands for transition metal catalysts, in functional materials, or as monomers for main group polymers. With these growing applications, it is important to develop new synthetic strategies to access known and novel classes of phosphoalkenes. Many synthetic routes to phosphoalkenes necessitate pre-formed phosphorus carbon single bonds, and these include one tree silyl migration or 1-2 elimination reactions in the presence of a base. A more appealing route is a late stage installation of the phosphinidine fragment and the direct synthesis of phosphoalkene from carbonyl compounds akin to the Wittig reaction has gathered significant interest. Several examples of phosphor-Wittig reagents are now known, but each come with their drawbacks, such as limited carbonyl scope, the need for stoichiometric metal, or the poor stability of the phosphor-Wittig reagent itself. We were inspired by early work which demonstrated that methylene boranes could undergo a borovitic reaction with carbonyl compounds to give alkenes. Since phosphoborines are isoelectronic to methylene boranes, we wondered whether these species could be directly used to prepare phosphoalkenes. Monomeric phosphoborines, however, have yet to be isolated in the absence of a Lewis acid or Lewis base. Previous work, however, in the Cowley group has demonstrated that transient phosphoborines can be readily accessed and trapped by unsaturated organic molecules, giving us a platform to further explore the chemistry of these species. The diphosphodiborotane starter material can be prepared on a multigram scale in several steps. First, by bromination of 135 tritope butyl benzene, followed by a lithium halogen exchange, salt metaphysis with phosphorus trichloride, and reduction with lithium aluminium hydride to give the primary supermesotile phosphine. The boron component is easily accessed from lithium TMP and boron trichloride, and combination of these precursors after in situ lithiation and silylation of the phosphine gives the diphosphodiborotane as a yellow crystalline solid, which is indefinitely stable in a solid state under an anino atmosphere. When the diphosphodiborotane is heated with ketones and aldehydes, we observed clean conversion through to the 1,2,3 phosphoborooxetanes, which are the formal 2 plus 2 cycloaddition products. Each of these have been characterized by single crystal X-ray diffraction and multinuclear NMR spectroscopy. These species are reminiscent of the four-membered oxetane intermediates in the classical Wittig reaction, and we considered whether cycloreversion to give a phosphoalkene and an amino boral oxide species would be possible. Despite the strained PBCO ring, we did not observe thermal elimination of phosphoalkenes from the 1,2,3 phosphoborooxetanes, even under harsh conditions. If, however, we add one equivalent of aluminium tribromide, we see clean and immediate conversion into the corresponding phosphoalkene. The boron-containing byproduct was identified as amino oxide trimer by NMR spectroscopy and mass spectrometry after the addition of pyridine to sequester the aluminium tribromide. An operationally simple one prop procedure can be employed to access known and novel phosphoalkenes in good to excellent yields. When the diphosphodiborotane is reacted with esters and amides, direct conversion to the phosphoalkene isomers is observed. The boron containing byproduct was now identified as the amino boral oxide dimer by NMR spectroscopy and single crystal X ray diffraction. When monitoring the reaction with ethyl acetate by NMR spectroscopy, we can observe signals in the phosphorus and boron NMR spectra consistent with a transient phosphoborooxetane intermediate. Known and novel compounds can again be prepared in good to excellent yields 
and this is the first example where phosphoalkenes can be prepared directly from esters and amides. DFT calculations were performed to understand the mechanism of this transformation and the different reactivity between aldehydes and ketones versus esters and amides. The first step is the dissociation of the diphosphodiboratine into the monomeric phosphoborine. Phosphoborines have orthogonal PB and BN pi systems and therefore exhibit both nucleophilic character at phosphorus and electrophilic character at boron. We therefore consider two main pathways, namely the formation of a betaine-like intermediate by the attack of phosphorus at the carbonyl carbon or coordination of the carbonyl oxygen to boron. We could not locate a betaine-like structure as a minima and instead found that the phosphoborine and acetone first form a coordination adduct, which is labelled as intermediate 2. During the early transition state 2, we observed lengthening of the PB and CO bonds. This increases the electrophilicity of the carbonyl carbon, priming it for nucleophilic attack by phosphorus, which closes the ring to give the isoluble phosphoborooxetane, which is stabilised relative to its precursors. The barrier for cyclo reversion is close to 39 kilocalories per mole, which is consistent with our experimental observations that this reaction cannot be promoted thermally and instead requires a lowest acid. A slightly different and shallower reaction pathway was observed for NN dimethylacetamide. Here we were unable to locate a phosphoborine adduct and instead observed direct cyclo addition through transition state 2 to form the phosphoborooxetane. This can now exist as two pairs of diastere isomers due to stereogenic phosphorus and carbon centres. And whilst the RS enantiomer is slightly less stable relative to the precursors, we were unable to locate transition states leading to the SS or RR enantiomers. The barrier for cycle reversion from the RS enantiomer is now only 12 kilocalories per mole, which is again consistent with the transient nature of the phosphoborooxetane and direct access to the corresponding phosphoalkene. So why is the acetamide transition state much lower in energy when compared to acetone? Firstly, TS2 acetone is highly puckered with a PBOC torsion angle of 48.8 degrees and a much shorter BO bond length. Contrastingly, in TS2 acetamide, the two components come together much more synchronously and the developing PBCO ring is much flatter with a torsion angle of 24.2 degrees. This means there is less decrease in the BN pi bonding as the phosphorus boron nitrogen angle is distorted away from linear in TS2. In addition, we observe that TS2 acetamide is perfectly oriented to enable hydrogen bonding between the carbonyl oxygen and the methyl groups of the TMP substituent, which can account for stabilizing interactions up to 4 kilocalories per mole. We see in TS2 acetone that these interactions are less prominent. In summary, the phosphoborovitic reaction exploits the unique reactivity of transient phosphoborines to provide direct access to known and novel phosphoalkenes directly from a range of carbonyl compounds, including aldehydes, ketones, esters and amides. DFT studies provided insights into the contrasting reactivity between the different classes of carbonyl compound and furthermore revealed deep and far-reaching mechanistic similarities to the classic Wittig reaction. That leads me to thank Dr. Michael Cowley for his guidance on the computational studies and to the rest of the Cowley group, especially to Ella Rice who helped me with this project. This work was supported financially by the ERC and RSC. And finally, I'd like to thank Matt again for this opportunity to present my research. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode. And thank you very much to Andre for coming on again to talk about your work. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.